Recall that in our discussion on electric charge, we said that electric charge is quantized on the microscopic level. So that basically means that electric charge exists only in discrete pieces, in discrete increments. And the smallest possible increment of electric charge is given to be about 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And that is the charge found on one electron. Now even though electric charge is quantized on the microscopic level, on the macroscopic level we can treat electric charge as being distributed continuously. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to divide our electric charge into infinitely small pieces given by dq. That's exactly what we're going to do in this lecture in which we're going to solve, we're going to find the electric field at some given point as a result of a macroscopic thin ring composed of some charge given by Q. So, suppose a thin ring of radius R carries a charge that is distributed evenly and continuously around the following thin ring. Determine the electric field at point A, a distance x from the center of that ring as shown in the following diagram. So, let's look at the following diagram. We have the following thin ring and the charge on this ring which is continuous is given to be Q. So this entire ring has a charge of positive Q. So we want to determine what the electric field is at this point A, a distance x from this thin ring. Now the radius of the ring is given by capital letter R. So let's begin by essentially dividing our section of this ring into infinitely small sections given by dl. Now notice the entire section, the entire length of this ring is given by the circumference. 2 pi multiplied by r. And we're taking very small segments of that circumference given by dl. Now within each segment dl, there is an infinitely small charge given by dq, given by the following uh, two letters, so dq. Now we want to essentially first calculate what the electric field is at point A as a result of this small charge dq. And then we want to integrate around the entire ring. We want to sum up all these small vectors because by the superposition principle of vectors we know to calculate the net vector at point A, we simply sum up all the different vectors due to all the different charges dq. And let's begin by determining what the electric field is at this point A as a result of the infinitely small charge dq found in this infinitely small region given by dl. And by the way, the distance between dl and this point A is given by m. So, Let's begin by realizing that because this is a positive charge, that means the electric field at this point will point along an axis that lies along this line M and it will point away. And that's because this is a positive. If this was a negative charge, this would point along the M line directly towards our section of DQ. So this is our vector dE that is a result of the charge dQ found in this small section. And notice that this vector makes an angle theta and this theta is the same as this theta. So we're going to find what this angle is in terms of two sides in just a moment. But realize that this angle theta is the same angle theta as found in this right triangle. So notice because this is a vector that points at an angle, that means it will have an x component given by this and a y component given by this. This will become important in just a moment. 
Now, recall the equation for electric field. The electric field as a result of some charge Q is given by that charge Q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught multiplied by m squared, in this case the distance between our two points and the charge. Now we also define something known as alpha. So this is a constant that gives us the charge per unit length and this will become important in step two of our problems. So we divide our problem, our example, into five steps. Let's begin with step one. We want to determine the electric field at point A as a result of this small section DL which has a charge given by DQ. So DE is equal to the charge so dq divided by 4 pi epsilon naught multiplied by m squared. Now let's move on to part 2. In part 2 we want to use this and we want to calculate what the alpha is in this case. So let's begin by defining what the entire charge is in our thin ring. So we know the charge is given to be Q. This is the total charge on our thin ring. Now the entire length of the thin ring is given to us to be our circumference. So 2 pi r is the circumference of the ring. It's the entire length of our thin ring. So that basically means that we can represent our charge dq in terms of the length and the full charge. So our dq is equal to the total charge q multiplied by the fractional ratio of this small section to the entire section. So dq is equal to q multiplied by the small section divided by the total length. So if we take the 2 pi r and we bring it underneath the q, we get the following result. dq is equal to q divided by 2 pi r multiplied by dl. Now q, the total charge, divided by 2 pi r, the total length, is simply our constant alpha. So we can represent this ratio as simply alpha. So we see dq, the charge found in the section dl, is equal to alpha, a constant, multiplied by dl. So, let's move on to step 3. In step 3, we want to simply represent our dq in terms of alpha and dl. And dl. So we replace dq with this quantity. So dE, our infinitely small electric field at point A, as a result of this charge, is equal to alpha multiplied by dl divided by 4 pi epsilon naught multiplied by m squared. So we represent our electric field in terms of our length. So in step 5 we actually want to integrate. So notice that this section is simply the electric field as a result of this small section. And so to find the net electric field we have to sum up all these different dqs, all these different sections given by dl. Now before we move on let's notice the symmetry. So, by symmetry, if we take a small, infinitely small section given by dL right across this section, we'll get an electric field that points directly in this direction. So notice our electric field along the x-axis will still point in this direction, but our electric field along the y-axis will point downward. In fact, it will have the same exact magnitude as this, but it will point downward. So because we're adding these y components, these will cancel out. And it turns out that by symmetry, all our DEY components will in fact cancel out. So for example, if we choose this section, there will be a component of this section in which these two guys will cancel out. So that means, therefore, we only have to worry about the X component. So these will cancel out, so we're only adding these components. So that implies that our electric field, the net electric field, is equal to the net electric field along the x-axis, along the x-component. 
So, this is equal to the integral of all these small sections. So, the integral of dex. Now, what exactly is dex in terms of de? We'd like to represent dex in terms of de because in part 3, we have this equation in terms of de. So, because we have a triangle here, we can use the cosine trig function. Cosine of the angle theta multiplied by DE is equal to DEX. And that's exactly what we replace DEX with. This is equal to the integral of cosine of this angle theta multiplied by DE. So, we simply take this DE and we replace the DE with this entire equation. So, this is equal to the integral of cosine of the angle theta multiplied by our constant alpha multiplied by DL divided by 4 pi epsilon naught multiplied by m squared. So we take our constants and we bring the constants out. So we're going to bring our alpha, 4 pi and epsilon out. And now we have uh, alpha divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. We take the integral cosine of the angle theta multiplied by dl divided by m squared. Now, what exactly is cosine theta in terms of these sides? So, because we have a right triangle, we can essentially use the trig function. So, we see that cosine of the angle theta is equal to adjacent x divided by hypotenuse m. So, cosine of the angle theta is equal to x divided by m. And what exactly is m in terms of r and x? So we have a right triangle, so that means m squared is equal to r squared plus x squared. So that implies that m is equal to the square root of x squared plus r squared. So we go back to this equation and we replace cosine theta and m squared with the following two results. So that's exactly what we do in this section. So notice that we have x divided by m, so the bottom will become x squared plus r squared multiplied by m multiplied by this will give us x squared plus r squared raised to the power of 3 divided by 2. So we have alpha multiplied by x divided by 4 pi epsilon naught multiplied by this and we take the integral from some point zero all the way around this thin ring. So we integrate from zero to two pi r, which is the length of that thin ring. So we integrate and we get the following result. Notice we can take our alpha now and replace alpha with the charge divided by the length. So alpha becomes q divided by 2 pi r. So we have 2 pi r on top and bottom, we can cancel those out and the q is left on top. And we get qx divided by 4 pi epsilon naught x squared plus r squared raised to the power of 3 divided by 2. So this is our electric field at point A that is a result of a thin ring of charge that has a continuous distribution.